Well, so happy Mother's Day to all of you who are mothers. The rest of you, just ignore it. <laughs> I'm thinking of Psalm 139. David says, for you have created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. I think about the miracle of what it is to, to have children and to be able to bear children and, to, and the difficulty of raising children and what a tremendous honor and privilege it is, but it's also a heavy responsibility. And moms pretty much uh, bear the brunt of that because you're with the kids more than dad is. At least in my home, that was the case. So, uh, I mean, unless you're fortunate enough to hire somebody else to raise your kids, then I wonder what the point is. But anyway, to those of you who are moms, congratulations. Um, if, you're, if your children have survived to this point and if they're not in jail, that, that's a good thing. You, you know, hopefully you've had some influence. Uh, but as we all know, children decide their own path, don't they? At some point, they outgrow you and they go and step out on their own. That's uh, My mom used to say all the time, she goes, you raise your children and if you've done a good job, they leave you. Which is true. Well, we're going to continue on with our study in Genesis in chapter 35. We've been looking at the life of Jacob and God has been calling him to go to Bethel where he first met him, the house of God, and calling him back. And we've seen him take a detour. He didn't go where God told him to go. He went to Shechem. And if you remember, he met up with Esau, his brother, and he was afraid to go to Mount Seir with him, which is where Esau's from. And he says, no, you go ahead on without me and I'll, you know, I'll catch up with you. And he never does. And uh, as, as soon as he goes southeast, he goes northwest and he goes in the opposite direction of Esau, not trusting him. So I think you can forgive and forget, but then also look for somebody to prove themselves to be faithful and not necessarily entrust yourself to somebody who's of the flesh. And I think that's what Jacob does. So just as a reminder of what we went over last week, I'm going to go through it really fast. If you remember Dinah, the one girl that is mentioned in the line of Jacob, she wants to go out and see what the daughters of men are doing in the, in the town of Shechem, what the local fashions are or what have you. And so she goes and she checks it out. She's about 13 to 15 years old. And of course, a handsome young man shows up. He's the prince of Shechem. The town's named after him. So he's, you know, if he could, he'd pull up in a, in a, in a Lotus or a Lamborghini and uh, sweeps her off her feet and entices her into a sexual relationship, which is degrading for a woman who is between 13 and 15 years old and a virgin keeping herself for marriage. And there's some language in there which questions whether it was a forcible rape because she ends up staying with him from this point on as he goes to negotiate a marriage. So he is the prince and he's quite spoiled and he's used to getting what he wants. Maybe you've met this type. Hopefully you aren't this type. But then her father or his father comes and tries to negotiate and they usually negotiate a sum. And as they talk about this, Jacob finds out about it and he does nothing. He stays silent and he waits for his sons to come from in the field from doing all their work and he basically entrusts all judgment to his sons, which isn't a good idea if you're a dad, right? Especially if they're very young. But even when they're old, they can also make very bad decisions. So Shechem comes out, the father of Shechem comes out and is uh, the Hamor, and he's trying to negotiate. And uh, the boys get very, very angry about what happened when their father has shown no emotion whatsoever to this point. And he hasn't said anything. In fact, they're the ones who are now doing the negotiating. They're having the conversation with Hamor. Then they said, well, listen, it's not right for us to do this, um, to marry off our sister to you because you guys aren't circumcised. So what I want you to do is everybody, all of your people have to get circumcised or the deal's off. And we're going to take our sister and go. And so Shechem says, okay cool, I'll do whatever you want. Whatever it is that you want, I will do it. And so they say, okay, we'll do it. And by the way, 
she's not there with them. She's back at Shechem's place, kind of being held ransom almost. A good negotiation move, but not a good move to be using human beings as pawns. And so Shechem says, yeah, let's get to it. Let's, let's do this thing. So they call the men of the city together and they said, listen, we're going to give our daughters to them. They're going to give their daughters to us. We're going to intermarry. We're going to be one big happy family. And my goodness, what a great family to move into because they've got all kinds of stuff. They've got lots of things and their stuff will become our stuff. And you get to see his motivation beneath it is really to be prospered. Well, as they get circumcised on the third day when they're in pain and they're not able to move around, uh, children recuperate much better from this if, if it's done early. Uh, the brothers go in. The two brothers go in and assassinate every male in the entire city. And they level it basically. So they take all of the women, they take all of the children as ransom and take them away. And they destroy the city of Shechem. And so they dishonor the name of Israel, who's not really using his new name yet. And he still, still goes by Jacob because he's pretty much in the flesh. And then his last final statement and Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And since I am few in number, they will gather themselves against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. But they said, should he treat our sister like a harlot? And we're left with this whole question. What to do in a situation like this? Somebody rapes your daughter, or rapes your sister, uh, do you go and kill every member of their city? I think any of us would, with a half a mind would say absolutely not. That's not justice, is it? That's not even vengeance. That's just craziness. That's cruelty. So you've got these reckless brothers who go out and do this, and the two brothers that are responsible, Simeon and Levi, they are now kind of on, the, uh, on, uh, on Santa's coal list, so to speak. They're not exactly the favorite brothers. Now, they're two of the oldest brothers, or the two of the oldest sons that Jacob has. He only has one other who's older, and that would be Reuben. He's going to play um, quite prominently in the, in the following chapter. So all of this goes on, and Jacob is complaining about how it affects him. He's not thinking about the death of his wife or his kids or his sons. He says, me, I, it's, you have made trouble for me. Uh, he's, he's a typical avoider. He hasn't made a decision to deal with this. And so he left it to the boys and the boys overreacted. And now he might be feeling a little guilty that he didn't step up, that he was a little too passive. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had the situation where you left a decision to somebody else and you were passive and they didn't decide or correctly or rightly. And you somehow have blood on your hands because you participated in allowing it. So it's rather interesting. I don't think I brought it out in the last week, but should, should he treat our sister like a harlot, the he that they're referring to is their father. So you see the sons are pitted against the father and the father against the sons. The antecedent is the son's. And he's speaking of his, their father and saying, should dad treat her like she's a common harlot? Because Shechem didn't treat her like a, a harlot. Shechem may have initially been attracted and he stepped over some bounds and took some liberties that he shouldn't have taken. But the thing is, she ended up staying with him. She ended up staying and waiting for the answer. And he went to pursue marriage. You don't pursue marriage with a harlot. I mean, unless you watch Pretty Woman on TV. You don't pursue long distance, you know, long enduring relationships with a harlot. And he didn't pay her, you see. So it's not Shechem who's treating her like a harlot. It's their father by doing nothing. So you've got this friction between the sons and the father. Sorry, I didn't bring that out last week. So there are all kinds of things about taking shortcuts, about going and not going where God's told us to do. Sometimes there are consequences that will have long lasting effect. Amen. He takes a left turn when he shouldn't have taken a left turn. And he's just 50 miles away from doing what God wants him to do. But he stops short and he builds a house and he settles in and 
He thinks that that's where he's going to be. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to do that, to settle in a place where God didn't tell you to settle. But if any of you are in that place, you should get out soon before something happens you can't undo. So this week, we're going to look at him going home. It begins with the Lord speaking to him. And then God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. So he's saying, go back to the place where I first spoke to you. Remember where that was? It's interesting because the same thing gets said to the Ephesian church in the book of Revelation. He says, you know, I, I, you hate the Nicolaitans as I do, and you know, you, you're, you don't stand for false teachers, but this I have against you, you have left your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. He's asking them in Ephesus to go back to the place of their first love. And it's interesting when you have the, the opportunity to speak to people that have fallen away from the Lord, there's almost always a traumatic event that's occurred where they couldn't reconcile who God is with what's happened in their life. You know, oh, I used to go to church. Yeah, I used to, but you know, something happened and they, they couldn't quite digest it. So what they did is they left. I find that very often happens. Well, Jacob does this. He, he does something where he's not supposed to and he gets shipped off by his mom and mom says, I'll call you when we're ready for you. And she never calls for him. And then he gets ripped off and he can't really go home, but it's certainly better than staying with Laban. So God is kind of forcing him into this situation. And certainly he can't be comfortable here because this isn't where God wants him to be. So he's moving on. By the way, this is the place called Bethel. And this is what is believed to be the altar that he set up. Uh, the, the Muslims were good enough to build a dome over the top of it as they, they do. Uh, they put a dome over the top of it and this is actually in Bethel. And so the Lord tells him to go. God is neither mentioned nor sought while in Shechem. And time to return to the house of God. God's name is conspicuously not mentioned in the last chapter at all. He doesn't worship. He doesn't set up an altar in that chapter. He doesn't call on the name of the Lord. You don't hear God's name mentioned once the entire chapter while he's in Shechem. When he first gets there, he sets up an altar, but that's in the previous chapter. And then it's a bit of a slap in God's face because of what the boys do by going in and killing everyone in the city. It's kind of a slap in God's face to wear the name Christian and then do something as heinous as that. Have any of you had the embarrassment of having lived that out? Yeah. Okay, just the two of us? Okay. It's funny how songs pop into my head when I say things like that. <laughs> God will be mentioned 22 times in this chapter. And so there's this revival, there's this returning to the house of God, to the place where God is. And it's, it's kind of a submission a decision to go back to the place where God wants you to be. That's always the best place to be is where God wants you to be. In verse two, and Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you, purify yourselves and change your garments and let us arise and go up to Bethel. And I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way in which I have gone. And so they gave Jacob all their foreign gods, which were in their hands and the earrings, which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree, which was in Shechem. And I know some of you are thinking, where's that tree? There could be some ancient treasures under that tree but I'm sure somebody thought of it before you did. I did. No, I, somebody else did. And so he gathers everybody together and says, put away your foreign gods. What are they doing with foreign gods? Wouldn't you think as the head of the household, he would make sure that there weren't any foreign gods in, there, in his house? There's no little idols hanging about that people are worshiping. 
And it's interesting because God always brings revival after a long spell of godlessness. And here's one of those times right here. And you can, you can see this happening over and over throughout the scripture. You'll see this downfall where people just, like in the book of Judges, where everybody did what was right in their own eyes, and there was all of this craziness going on. And then suddenly, there's someone who is born whose name's Samuel. And Samuel is a prophet of God, and he rises up in the house of Eli, where Eli can't even raise his own son's right. I would think, Lord, you don't want to give that kid to him. He doesn't know what he's doing, and yet God's hand is upon Samuel. And Samuel learns to fear the Lord and serve the Lord. And there's a time of revival in Israel again because God chose Samuel to do so. So these, these little terebinths that we, we talked about, these, these little idols that they had. If you remember, Rachel stole them from her brother, stole them from Laban's house. So she had some, and apparently he knew about it, but he didn't do anything about it. But see, he's making a clean break here, isn't he? We're not going to go to the house of God and drag with us these idols. And also change your clothes because the boys probably had their clothes stained with blood. So guys, we're going to leave all this behind and we're going to repent and we're going to lay this stuff down and we're going to go to the house of the Lord. It's a really, really good decision after a long period of time of trying to settle in. It says in 1 John, in the New Testament, chapter 5, verse 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. And that's how 1 John closes out. Now, I'm not sure if any of you have any idols in your pocket. You have, you have any idols in your pocket? If you have a Giants team logo on you, that might do. Or a New York Yankees emblem on your coffee cup. As long as you're not worshiping that over God, it should be okay. But it's interesting when it says, beware of these idols, keep yourselves from these idols. There are things which we can put in a much higher priority. I've seen people get so excited over a baseball game and can't even lift their voice to worship on a Sunday. I'm just saying. I've seen people be really excited about many things, but not in church. You can get excited about listening to Highway to Hell. You know, you can listen to music that says all kinds of crazy things and you can get into it and your soul suddenly is, is you know, encouraged. But why can't you do that in worship? Why can't you lose yourself in the worship of God Almighty? And yet you get yourself all excited. You might even go out dancing, you know, but I will dance in the land of the living. Yeah, but who are you dancing for? Anyway, I'm just saying, that's my back door. So he passively allows this till now. We're seeing kind of a trend with Jacob that he's passively allowing a whole lot of stuff that he really shouldn't be allowing, but he's taking a stand now, isn't he? He's saying, that's it, I've had enough. We're going to put the idols away, change your clothes. We're going to the house of God. In 2 Chronicles 16.9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. It's an amazing thing that God is looking for people to partner with him. His eyes roam to and fro throughout the entire earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. How would you turn down such a partnership? But it says God looks to and fro, which, which tells me there's not many Jesus says the same thing. There aren't many who find the path that leads to life. There's few there be that find it. But wide is the gate and easy is the way that leads to the other place. And there's many that find that one. In Proverbs 22, 6, it says that you should train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Amen. Any of you heard that before? Yes. You know what that means? It means you beat them, <laughs> tell them what not to do, and eventually they'll get it. Amen. Well, it's a little bit more than that, actually. The word, the word for train, I'll go back here. The word for train is chonek, 
Everybody say Chonek. <laughs> sounds like Vulcan, doesn't it? Chonek. It's a primitive root and narrow or figuratively to initiate or discipline, to dedicate or to train up. That's what it means to train. But it means more than that. It means to encourage or stimulate an appetite to feed. It's rather interesting. A little bit later, apparently the nominative form is to rub the palate of a child with chewed dates. Yeah, that's what it means. A midwife would rub the palate of a newborn with oil or would rub it with dates, which are very, very sweet. And what it would do is it would cause the child to begin the sucking action and so it would be ready for them to feed. And so it's kind of like priming the pump, so to speak, uh, in mechanical terms. It's getting the child to have an appetite to feed. That's what it is to train up a child in the way you should go. It's training them to have an appetite to feed on what? On the word of God. Parents do that by demonstration, not necessarily instruction. It's about what you do, not, not so much what you say. Because they'll, you know, it's not what's taught, it's what's caught very often. So it's an interesting thing to train up a child in the way you should go is about priming them so that they'll have an appetite to feed and hopefully they'll feed on the things of the word of God. Amen? I just thought that was an interesting bit of trivia that might make this day a little easier for you to digest. Chapter five, uh, chap chapter 35, verse five. And they journeyed and the terror of God was upon the cities were all around them and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. So it's an interesting thing that he goes and nobody attacks him. That's the thing he was afraid of, right? He said, all the people in the, in the neighborhood, they're going to come and kill us and we're few in number and, and now they're all mad and you got them all mad at me. Well, it turns out that none of them bother him at all. None of them. Wonder why that was. It was the terror of God. It was God protecting them. You see, we, we fear a lot of things and, and some of us are very fear-based, others of us are pride-based, but fear is one of those things where you can fear the unknown, you can fear the worst possible scenario and waste a whole lot of time ruminating about such things to the point where you can be completely captivated and become inactive so that you can't do anything. But here the Lord prevented. In fact, it, it's a prophecy, I think, in Proverbs 16, 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. There's something about the Spirit of God undertaking behind the scenes that we don't see because he's active in our lives, amen? And because we trust in him, I know that he has my back, so I'm not going to worry about the things that I can't see and I can't uh, prepare for. I'm going to let God take care of that. I'm going to prepare for what I can, though, and I'm going to leave the rest up to him. And I'm going to lay it at the foot of the terebinth tree. I'm going to bury it. And, of course, whenever you hear tree in the scripture, I always think about the cross. And that's where we lay everything, don't we? We lay it at the feet of Jesus. We lay it at the cross. And that's where we put our idols, and that's where we put our concerns and our cares and our worries. We put them underneath the tree. And so he's got all of these people. He says, we're few in number. It's, it's always a comparison. It's kind of like saying you're, you're old. It's, it's a subjective thing. You know, it depends on who you're comparing yourself to. He says, we're few in number. And so remember, they, they've gotten all of these women and children too from Shechem. So they are much bigger than they were before. The scripture says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye says in Psalm 32, 8. Isn't that interesting? How do you guide somebody with your eye? <coughs> You're all very quiet today. <laughs> in the Latino culture, they guide people with their lips. They go like this. <laughs> I see the Latinos laughing because it's true little duck face and a nod and there you go. <laughs> the scripture says this in Psalm 32, you might be familiar with that. I'm just going to read it through quickly. It's a contemplation. 
Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man in whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. This is David speaking of himself when he sinned. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Salah. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. And for this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. Many sorrows shall be of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all of you upright in heart. The scripture teaches us that we shouldn't have to be like a mule, which you sometimes have to beat, which sometimes you have to get several people on and pull them and get them to go where you want them to go. And it says, don't be like that. Be somebody that comes before God and confesses your sins and lays them at the foot of the cross and says, here I am, Lord, have your way with me. I'm not all that, I'm not even all that that I think I am because my heart is desperately wicked above all things who can know it. And I don't even know the depth of my own sinfulness before a holy God. And so instead of having something exposed and being forced to do something that the Lord would have you do, just lay it down. Don't be like a mule. Don't be like a horse that has to be led or tugged. Allow the Lord to train you, train you up in the way you should go. And he built an altar there and he called the place El Bethel because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. Now Deborah... Rebecca's nurse died and she was buried below Bethel under the terebinth tree. There's a lot of stuff under these trees. And so the name of it was called Alan Bukuth, which means the, the tree of, of weeping. Now he goes back to Bethel where God first initiated contact with him and he called it Bethel, right? Which means the house of God. And now he calls it El Bethel. Now it's not Spanish. El means the in Spanish. El means God. So now it's God of the house of God. It's no longer the house of God. It's the God of the house of God. His attention is no longer on the house of God. It's now on the God of the house of God. You know, Grace Bible Fellowship, we call the house of God, but it's not about the house of God. It's about the God of the house of God. The Bible, which we're, we're dedicated to studying and understanding and submitting our life to, the Bible is not God. It contains the word of God. It is the word of God. And yet, it's about the God of the Bible. It's not about a book with pages. Boy, if, you know, if they could be stolen like those little idols were stolen from Laban, then we got a problem. Oh no, they took our Bibles away. What will happen to our faith? It's the God of the Bible. It's the God of the place. And you see, he's not impressed. Remember, he said, God was in this place and I didn't know it. He was, impre he was impressed with the geography, not the person. Now he's saying El Bethel, the God of the house of God, which I think is significant because that's where our attention should be, right? Yeah. And so here's a terebinth tree. And that's where Deborah, it's interesting. Deborah was Rebecca's nurse, which is Isaac's wife. So they may have just come into this neighborhood and actually run into Deborah and suddenly she's on her way out. I doubt that they took her away from Rebecca. They took her away from uh, their great grandfather, the boys. So it's, it's a interesting thing that Deborah is mentioned because she's not mentioned elsewhere, is she? 
but she's mentioned here that she died and they put her under the tree. I, I guess that's where you put things to rest. And so they put her under the terebinth tree, which uh, Alan Bakuth means oak of weeping. Uh, Alan means oak. And so now he's back in Bethel at the stone. If you remember, Abraham set up an altar here. If you remember, this has been a place always of meeting with God. And now it's a place where he's meeting with God. And then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Pat Amaram and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall be called, will not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Uh, if you're interested, that means El Shaddai. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you, and to your descendants after you I will give this land. And then God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. And so Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone. And he poured out a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke to him, Bethel. It sounds like an entirely, it's like a rewind of everything that happened. But this is actually God speaking to him yet again in the same place, in the same way. And notice he gets the same information because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You ever had the Lord speak to you something that you already knew? Happens to me all the time. I'm reading through the scripture. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're just wandering through and you stumble on something. And you go, wow, I didn't see that. But I, but I know I've been through here a bunch of times. And I just didn't see that. God comes to him and reminds him who he is. He reminds him of where he was. He reminds him of where he's going. He reminds him of all of that. Don't we need that? We need to remember whose we are and to whom we serve. And it's not about the things that sometimes we make it. Jacob was reminded of who he was and that God had previously promised him. No new revelation, <laughs> just something that he had to live up to. Your name is Israel. It means governed by God. Remember that. You're not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. He reminds him of his new name, not his old name. It reminds me of a time when there was new information, uh, no new information, new application. And, and don't we all need that reminder? Of course we do. It reminds me of Jesus when he was on the road to Emmaus. Do you remember? Everyone thought he was out. It was the third day and two disciples were leaving and they're going to Emmaus. It's like a 12 mile journey. And as they're walking, somebody pulls up behind them uh, as invariably happens on sidewalks, especially in the summer when a lot of people are using it. And Jesus pulls up and they don't know it's Jesus. And he goes, what is it that you talk about as you walk along and are sad? And one of them says, well, it's this Jesus of Nazareth. We thought he was, you know, the one who was going to come and deliver Israel. And he was full of, you know, miracles and great deeds. And we, we set our, our sights on him that he was the one who would redeem Israel. But they hung him on a cross and he died. And it's been three days. And Jesus rebukes them. He says, how slow to heart you are to believe all the things that the scriptures have said. And it's funny because Jesus doesn't give them any new revelation. He reminds them of everything they should already know. In Luke 24 verses 26 and 27, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus pulled alongside of these folks that needed encouragement and he didn't give them any new revelation. He just gave them application of something they should have already known. You know, very often we need that. I need to be reminded of the same old things that I know, but I need to be reminded of them. Some of us get all excited about new revelation. Ooh, I need something new. 
Maybe, maybe, oh, did you hear? There's a, there's a, a revival going on in Kentucky. We should get a flight and go there. You know, we should, we should go, you know, there's some statue that weeps, some, some statue that's bleeding. Okay. And we, what are you going to do with that? Because it's not about the place. It's about the God of the place. And the God of the place is here. The God of the place is everywhere. So you can run around and look for new revelation. And there are a lot of people that have wet their appetite for something new. I have to have something new. Sometimes we forget what we should remember. We remember the things we should forget. And then at the end of the story here in Luke 24, 32, and they said to one another, did, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? We need a fresh heartburn, don't we? being reminded of the things that God has already said and that he means. Very often we just walk away from those things. And so God reinstitutes his relationship with Jacob when Jacob's finally at a place where he's being obedient to do what God wants him to do. And then they journeyed to Bethel from Bethel. Now, where are they going, you think? He's going home. He's going to see dad, so you know. And so they journeyed from Bethel and when... And when there was but a little distance to go to, to Ephrath, by the way, you might know that as Bethlehem, Rachel labored in childbirth and she had a hard labor. You didn't even know she was pregnant, did you? With her second child. Now it came to pass that when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, do not fear, you will have a son also. And I have news for you. When a lady's in labor, there's nothing that makes her feel better. <laughs> nothing. Can I get you an ice chip? Get away from me. <laughs> How many men have seen this? You've seen this phenomenon? <laughs> the don't touch me, don't come near me, get away from me? Okay. I mean, <laughs> not my wife, but you guys. <laughs> Do not fear, you will have a son also. And so it was, as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Ben-Ani. But his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Interesting. So, didn't know Rachel's pregnant. The one who wasn't able to get pregnant for the longest time finally has Benjamin. She's bringing up the rear with her second son, and his name is Bonami, which means son of my pain. She names him as a parting gesture, son of my pain. You are a pain. In a moment of grief, Jacob thinks, and he says, I'm going to call him Benjamin, which means it's very close to Amin, but it's Benjamin, which you might say Benjamin, but it's Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. Son of my right hand. My, his, this was his favorite wife. This is the only one he really wanted. The other three came with the deal. She's the son of his right hand. She's, he is essentially the replacement for his wife. And you can see why Benjamin and Joseph get special favor from here on in the book of Genesis, now that Rachel's gone. So this is actually where Rachel is buried in Bethlehem. It's a, it's a very um, treacherous area to go to because of the Palestinians. It's on the West Bank. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you get a chance to go there, you'll see what it looks like. There's one other time when Idiomatically, Rachel is mentioned. It's in Jeremiah 31, 15. Thus says the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. We get to see this prophecy and how it was fulfilled during the time of Jesus Christ because Matthew brings it up in chapter 2, verse 16. It's when Herod knew that the wise guys, the three, the three wise men, deceived him, and they went out another way. And so what he did is he said, every child that's two and under, every male, male child, I want them dead in the city of Bethlehem. 
and that's where Rachel is buried. And so that's, she's idiomatically referred to as Bethlehem and that her children are no more. Uh, so this is called the, the, the martyr of the innocents. So this is what it looks like on the inside of Rachel's um, tomb. Of course, they fixed it all up since she was buried there. But you see that he, he puts up pillars everywhere he goes. And so we know where these things are. And then Israel journeyed and he pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. And it happened when Israel dwelt in the land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. No gasps. Tonight at movie at 11. Man sleeps with his stepmother with his father's wife. Yeah, you thought our society was messed up. You're right. It's nothing new. So Reuben, and Reuben is the oldest, by the way. From now on, he's just going to be making sandwiches. <laughs> Reuben's an interesting character because we see him throughout. In fact, a little bit later, you're going to see he's the one who doesn't want to kill Joseph. He's the one that preserves him and dumps him down in. He's also the one that went harvested mandrakes, if you remember, early on. And so he, he shows up periodically here and there. He's kind of uh, running the boys, except when they wanted to go kill people, and apparently he was not on board. Genesis 49, we see Jacob later on speaking of this. When he speaks a blessing before he dies, he's speaking blessing on all of his sons, and he comes to his eldest born, who's Reuben, and he says, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellence, the excellency of dignity and excellency of power. The compliments end there. Unstable as water, you shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed and you've defiled it. He went up to my couch. It's interesting. He doesn't say that to Reuben. He says that to everyone watching. He's pronouncing this blessing on him. And then he finally comes out with it. He went up to my couch. He took my wife. Don't you think he should have done something here? He should have dealt with it here. If you got any ideas of what he should have done, I'd love to hear it. Because on one hand, he's got a wife who's been unfaithful. I can guarantee you he won't be sleeping with her anymore. And he's got a son who perpetrated it. So what do you do to him? Plan an amputation. I mean, what do you do? How do you, how do you enforce this? You can't trust your wife anymore, right? Adultery. Well, once the law comes with Moses, you know what the, the, the side effect of that is. You're going to get stoned to death. So what do you do? He hears about it, doesn't do anything about it. That sounds, that sounds like it's part of his character, doesn't it? Be careful if, you, if you're an avoider of things, because it's not the way to deal with everything. There are certain things to be avoided. Loose tigers, <laughs> bears in your campsite. I can, I can think of many things to be avoided. It's a good idea. Uh, don't play frisbee on the parkway. There are lots of things that you can put in that category, but when there's a personal issue, it needs to be dealt with. And avoiding it is just going to make it worse. The very fact that he was a passive leader was part of the problem. And it's part of the thing that actually made this thing happen. I would prost I, I would. Anyway. Now the sons of Jacob were 12. He's got a full dozen. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon and Levi, we know that those guys are murderers, and Judah, who's now in the front running for blessing because the other three have disqualified themselves in the last two chapters, haven't they? Issachar and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin, the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maidservant, were Dan and Naphtali, and the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maidservant, were Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padamaram, or since he came from Padamaram, 
because we know that they all weren't born there. They were born since he went there, and that's where he gathered his wives. And so you have 12 tribes of Judah. You have a six-pointed star, and so you've got a place for everybody's name, including the mothers who are on the inside. And then Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kiljash Arba, that is Hebron. So there's three names for the same place. That's what happens when people overrun properties. They just rename them, like a restaurant that gets handed off. And Abraham and Isaac, where they had dwelt. And the days of Isaac were 180 years. He's an old dude. So Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days. And his sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. Isn't that interesting? We don't hear for Isaac for a long time. He comes home, and it just so happens that as he comes home, he's able to introduce all of the family to him. Isaac feels like, you know what? I can go home now. I'm feeling, I'm feeling like uh, we're all good. Remember, so many chapters ago, he said, Esau, why don't you go get me some of that good game? And when you bring it in, I'll bless you before I die. Well, it was 43 years later. <laughs> the guy was not dying. Although he may have thought he was, he wasn't dying. It was another 43 years of vital breathing and living. Oh, why don't you get me some of that good food before I die? And then 43 years later, oh, don't manipulate me, pal. 43 years. So they go home and they see Isaac and Isaac then finally rests his head on the pillow for the last time. And by the way, this is where he's buried. And so if you end up in Israel, you'll see where he is. He's buried in Hebron in this, uh, uh, underneath actually all of this. If you remember from Machpelah, there was a cave that was bought for Sarah when Sarah died and Abraham put Sarah there. And that's also where Abraham goes. That's where Isaac goes. And ultimately that's where Jacob will end up in the caves of Machpelah, which uh, means twin caves, actually. But it's all covered with uh, stone and artifacts now. It's called the Tomb of the Patriarchs. It's, uh, it, it's split in two, actually. There's, there's part of it which the Muslims worship and half of it which the Jews worship in. And so in this chapter, we have three deaths. We have Deborah, we have Rachel, and we have Isaac but we have revival and restoration at the same time where he comes back and he's back where God wants him to be. He's kind of on plan. He's in Bethel and then he even names it El Bethel, the God of the house of God. And so he's restored. So next week, we're going to look at the other family, which is the family of Esau and all of his descendants. So you guys can get all excited about many names and me getting hooked on phonics. <laughs> On the other end of chapter 36 comes chapter 37 where we're introduced to Joseph. And we begin the, the next bunch of chapters instead of focusing on Jacob or Isaac or Abraham, Joseph is going to be the centerpiece of God's grace. And we're going to see he's one of two people in the scriptures who do nothing wrong, at least that are recorded. And there's a reason for that. Daniel's the other guy in case you're wondering. There's nothing ever recorded he did anything wrong. And so we'll pick that up next week. Sorry.